the diktats of that country, majority of the countries nowadays, they align morally with the framework of liberalism. And in liberalism, different countries, well, most countries, they will determine which part of the body remains covered. So it's generally acceptable and agreed that the top half of the body and the private parts remains covered. Yeah. And even that's now becoming flexible. Like yeah, I guess yeah. it depends on the context, because like if you're at the beach, it's quite common for women not to wear anything on their top. I don't necessarily have an issue with that, but it's like depends on the context. Like a swimming pool, for example, women wear a bikini, but in another context, that like a, a women's a gentleman's club or whatever, you would see that in like a different context, wouldn't you? And it's the same clothing, so it's contextually dependent. But what I'm trying to boil this down to is what what is optimal? People being able to wear what they want to wear within reason, or people being compelled to wear something when they don't want to. So, like, I think it's good that in this country, if a woman wants to wear the burqa, she can. That's a great thing. But I, I wouldn't like it on the reverse side, where if a woman wants to express her religious, religious freedom without wearing a full face veil, but then people are trying to compel her and force her to wear it, then surely that is a bad thing, right? Okay, I think I know where you're coming from. So, I'm just going to make the point completely so in in the liberal country which most of the western nations where we're living is most of the laws i'll say all of the laws come from the framework of liberalism and then in liberalism you you have you have like certain principles of how you derive laws so you'll have it going to the House of Commons, then it goes to the House of Lords, then it comes back to the House of Commons. Yeah. And then you've got local councillors, and then certain rules and regulations are made. But it's done within the framework of liberalism. So in liberalism, it's you stay covered at the top, at the bottom. And even in the UK, I think, I haven't come across a beach, or maybe there's like a few beaches in which you are allowed topless, but they've got like... Um, it's sort of like... Yeah. Uh, I guess like a, a woman can get away with being topless, but like most people don't. But it's kind yeah. of one of those things where it's not necessarily going to be enforced. Correct me if I'm wrong, but in certain beaches, if a woman is topless and someone calls the police, she can get done for indecent exposure. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's something that like obviously police officers aren't going to be going around and policing. But then if somebody takes an issue with it, technically, yeah, yeah, they would be in the right. Like let's say you had a really conservative family and they there was like a bunch. Of uni students, they would, they and would, then yeah. If they all had their boobs out, then maybe they might be like, Come on, this is it. I don't, I, I don't know, like, they'd yeah. be in their rights to do that because, like, technically, they shouldn't be wearing it. But then, but, if it was to go to court, the, pr the principle that the that I don't the, think it would be worth prosecuting, like, uh, if just, just tell them, like, to you know, not do that if it's bothering other people, yeah, um, yeah. But it doesn't really cause that much harm, and I don't think a, a woman should go to prison if she's gone topless. Like, um, like, like maybe a fine at most, like yeah. a, a small fine, that, just so that they don't that, do it again. Like, yeah, I mean that's that's up to the law, isn't it? But the law, in principle, comes from the morality of liberalism, which, like you said, well, the harm principle. Yeah, yeah and the, the harm principle. Yeah, yeah. the harm principle, so, and even that is it's got certain uh, flexibility and. Um, the, the way it's applied but I think the, pr the point that I was going to make Max was that you've got this principle which is done and which is mapped out by the diktats of liberalism in it and it's done through yeah, th through the foundational principles of liberalism. Yeah, so but we use moral philosophy, like the harm principle, yes, yes. and then like maximizing freedom, uh, utilitarianism, the greatest yes. happiness for the greatest number. Yes. We incorporate quite a lot of philosophies in liberalism. Yes. It's something that evolves over time. Yes. So it's not like one specific thing. But um, I guess like ultimately what we want to do is like compare like what what is in the ideal world, what would be better? Like women being able to wear what they want to wear within reason or women being compelled to wear things against their will. So, okay. like, so let's say for example you did have a law where all women had to have full face veil covering. Like let's say make up an imaginary state like yeah. state X and in state X if a woman goes outside and she doesn't have a full face veil on, then she goes to prison. Like that wouldn't be a, a great thing, right? Like you would you would condemn that state X for doing that, right? Yeah. Let, let me just um, let me just finish the point. Yeah. So on the one hand, you've got the laws in the West that are dictated by liberalism, but in is in a Sharia compliant country, yeah. which would be technically a Muslim country. 
the, the laws of that country would be dictated by um, the legislation of Sharia from the Quran, from the sayings of the Prophet. So on the one hand, you've got morality from liberalism. On the other hand, you've got morality from that religion, from Islam. And then that's where the discussion now takes place that what makes your liberalism, sorry, what makes your morality or the rules that you're following to come up with this particular uniform more superior to the other one? Do you see? Is the Sharia law derived specifically from the Quran or a combination of the Quran and the Sunnah? Right? Yeah, so, yeah, okay. yeah, so the Sharia is derived from four principles. You've got the Quran. And then you've got the, the hadith or the sunnah, like you rightly pointed out. And then there's two more. Okay. And the two more. Yeah. But so aren't all of those four things open to interpretation a little bit? Like it's not like every single Muslim agrees on what exactly those four sources of information are saying. Right? So you even have like Sunnis or Shias, you have uh, Quranists, or you have Muslims who adopt both the Quran and the sunnah. So it's not like any one person can look to those four sources and then get the you know the hundred percent objective truth because it, the, the, the proof is in the pudding because there are loads of Muslims of different opinion on how yeah. they interpret it. So um, how do you navigate that issue? Yeah. So difference of opinion in Islam is is defined by difference of opinion that were that were there at the time of the companions, the companions of the Prophet. This is a it's a misconception that people think just because two people off the street have a difference of opinion that oh we'll take that difference of opinion it's like two regular joes walking down the street saying i think the law should be like this and somebody else going yeah i think the law should be like this the only legitimate way of saying that there's difference of opinion is if somebody credible within the judicial system says that okay there there is scope within the within case law or british law then we say okay that's fair kind enough. Of like we do in the UK, yeah, yeah, yeah. we appeal to the court system. Yeah, so Max, it's pretty much the same. This is, you know what? I think this is a straw man that people apply to Islam, that they think that Islam is really rigid. There are certain principles that, yes, they're, you know, they're, we call them aqidah ones, yeah, to do with I, belief. I don't agree with the argument that it's rigid because you have so many different kinds of Muslims who've interpreted it in a different way. And um, I wouldn't necessarily say because you have like a, I, I mean, you, you all have a difference of opinion, but like for me, being outside of the religion, I don't like different, I don't distinguish between like a Sunni Muslim and a Shia Muslim. I'm not like, well, that one is a, a real Muslim and that one isn't. They're, yeah. they're, they're all Muslims. If, if you uh, identify as a Muslim, you're a Muslim. That's my criteria for being a Muslim, but you might have a different criteria. No, to be fair, that makes sense. In fact, this is what we say as well. You know, sometimes when there's internal conflicts, we say, look, it doesn't matter to the average Brit, are you are you British? Yeah. So to the average Brit, they're not going to be looking into the intricacies of, uh, you know, are you a Sunni, are you a Shia? They're just going to be looking at you as a Muslim. So it's important how you behave and how you conduct yourself because that is the ideal form of da'wah, of preaching through your actions. And yes, you, you preach using your words as well, but primarily the best form of preaching is done through actions. Yeah. So what you're saying is actually, it's actually true. It's in fact what we say to each other as well, that look, instead of like some, some Sunnis and Shias will come to the park and then start arguments and say, look, this is not appropriate because an average person looking at you guys is just going to think, well, what on earth is going on? So, so going yeah. back to what you were saying about the authority, what yeah. authority would you be appealing to when you're, you, um, I think they're called clerics or, um, who, what do you call someone who's like well versed in all of the four sources that you talked about? What would you, is, like they're like a, a, not a priest, but like a... Yeah, so you're on the similar kind of trajectory, which is, uh, I mean, you can have any title, but in Islam, there is a hierarchy. Like you'll be somebody who's well versed is, is a sheikh. Okay. Then above him, somebody who can derive laws is a mufti. So he can derive laws within a certain paradigm. So it's the highest mufti. So, so the highest rank that you can get is a mujtahid. Somebody can do ijtihad. So that is to some degree, if you want to loosely kind of uh, t take somebody nowadays, you could say maybe a mufti. Okay. So Mufti is somebody that can, he's got like the bird's eye view, so he can come up with 
I mean, if he studied in the correct places, he can come up with a, a holistic thing. So if he says something, then you can take what he says seriously. So who, uh, who appoints a mufti as a mufti? So a mufti is like, it's like in schools. Oh, it's, it's like in this British system. You start with primary school, then you go secondary, then you do a master's, and then you do a PhD, and then you get peer reviewed. Yeah. So that's that's what it is. So, but, so yeah. would the Shia muftis be different from the Sunni muftis? Yeah. Okay. And like, how many muftis in like Sunni Islam are there? Would you say hundreds and thousands? Really? That many? So it's kind of like... Are you talking in the ages or are you talking... Well, no, 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 like in today, like... Uh, yeah, I'd say, I'd say thousands. Okay. So if you have thousands of muftis and yeah. you're a, Sh a, a Sunni or Shia Muslim yeah. and then you appeal to the mufti for like the right judgment on any yeah. given topic, would it always be the case that they would unanimously be agreed upon like what the correct course of action would be on any given subject matter or would there still be disagreement within the movements? It depends. There are certain principles within Sharia that there's no difference of opinion about. Yeah, for example... I'm kind of burning, I'm really... Fair, you know what, so should, like we like a, should we swap? Yeah, that might be acceptable. <laughs> no, 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 it's good you told me. I, I see what you mean now. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty intense. Well, I can take it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think you look like me now with the pen. No, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so in Islam, uh, I just saw a leaf fly down. I didn't want it to be lodged there, and then for the whole video, I've got like a leaf there. <laughs> You'll find it a few hours later, stuck in your beard. <laughs> <laughs> like my previous meal. Yeah. So, yeah, so um, you said, just remind me what you said. So, so, within any particular set, you might have thousands of muftis, and then amongst the muftis, oh, they don't opinion. necessarily always have a unanimous decision yeah. on any particular given subject matter. If you were to like, quiz them all on, I don't know, 10 questions in relation to modern topics. It's not like they would all answer unanimously on those. Yeah, so 85% of the religion, there's no difference of opinion. In 15% of the religion, that's where the difference of opinion comes. And even psychologically, if you look at the natural disposition of, of man, for example, if today we have a really wonderful conversation and you leave and you're like, look, smart to Jannah, amazing guy you know yeah. fantastic just like he's on there he's in person we had a really no, nice I, I do genuinely think that you're <laughs> a decent guy and with good intentions but obviously we just have disagreement in opinion and that's fine like yeah uh, that's absolutely I don't fine think everyone has yeah. to agree on anything like i think that you're well intentioned 100 uh, percent uh, but like, uh, so but your the stat that you pulled about eighty percent agreement, fifty percent disagreement. Yeah. Like I don't know what the split between should the Sunni and Shia divide is, but obviously there is this, this a difference in opinion there. But yeah. like, what's the split there? Because like, it's kind of depends on how you measure it, right? Yeah. So like, you might have like 50-50 Sunni Shia, and then within their own communities, they'll have other communities. So it's not. It's not like, I don't really, I, the way I see it, it's like you have lots of people who are Muslims because they identify as Muslims, but they still have like the same core beliefs, obviously like Allah is the God and Muhammad was the last messenger, but they still like, on, like in the minutiae, they still like have a difference in opinion. And then you've used the Muftis as that's an appeal to an authority, but what I'm saying is that authority in itself, like there will be di disagreements in the opinions there. Yeah. So like, it's like, how do you choose which Mufti to follow? Or, like, yeah, so coming back to the stat, so 85% of the religion, there'll be no difference of opinion. The 15% of the religion, that's where the difference of opinion comes. And unfortunately and sadly, that's the 15% that gets exploited. So it depends, like for example, oh, with... See. If yeah. you've got all of the subjects, yeah, yeah, yeah. 85%, the core majority is yeah. agreed upon, but then it's like the minutiae of yeah, 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 yeah. But that's not like, that's like a breakdown of the topics rather than like the population. Well. It's like I've done, I've done philosophy as well. And if a person was to be technical, Max, Technically speaking, you can't really arrest and imprison anyone if you're to if you're to do it on an objective moral basis. Because how are you going to objectively uh, prove that what that person has done is wrong objectively, and then give them a time in court or sorry a, a time in prison, 
and then for, let me give you an example they say if you rape somebody you can get about four years in prison if you take down a statue you can get eight years in prison now if we go to the nuts and bolts of the matter and we start saying okay but where's this number coming from yeah, how, how can you justify you? It, you yeah know, right? and if somebody gets really hooked on this sort of thing society won't be able to function so there's certain things that are accepted as axioms yeah. but the thing is in a good society that's stable like i'm sure you'd agree britain is pretty much a stable country it's uh well yeah i guess it depends on what way you measure it but relative to like the global stage yeah we have it pretty good here like in terms uh, of like coups and stuff where i mean if somebody actually made this point they said it's actually quite interesting uh, boris has done whatever he's done and there hasn't been one coup attempt in britain it's actually quite remarkable. Yeah, I guess. Compared to, say, America and what happened in Congress. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. Like, you, you do see protests, obviously, going on in Parliament Square, but Not there's the no real coup. But I think that's probably because our police are so sophisticated and specialised. We have, like, more CCTV in London than pretty yeah. much anywhere else in the world. And, our, yeah, our, our, our police yeah. are really highly trained. Yeah, exactly. so, like, uh, so there's other variables in place. So yeah. if you look at, say, Muslim countries, there's, you can't look at it uh, with a vacuum. The thing is, there's so many variables and so many principles that the layman doesn't understand. What, what, which yeah. country do you think does the best job out of all of the countries in like, trying to... I know that like, uh, you'll say that no country has implemented Sharia law 100%, but which country would you say has done the best job in implementing it? It, de it depends, to be honest, Max. Like, how do you define best? Some people will define it economically, some will say politically, some will say uh, in terms of the mosque building, like how many mosques are there and are the people able to walk around safely? Or how many non-Muslims are allowed? For example, Qatar, you've got the World Cup happening there. Another uh, Muslim country wouldn't be, you know, down with that, but they'd be more in that kind of... You see? How you're measuring success is kind of arbitrary. Exactly. And it could be dependent on a lot of different criteria. But yeah. like for you, which one do you like? If if you have a preference, like for me, like it, they're kind of doing the best job. If you had to pick one, like I'm just curious. To, what you're to, to be honest, Max, I'm a Brit, isn't it? And when you're living in Britain, I've noticed when you go to other countries, your standard, whether you like it or not, is going to be Britain. In fact, there was a study done psychologically. Have you always lived in? I have, I have, yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. because of that, even when I go... I think to, it's inevitably going to... The cultural influences are going to be ingrained into you. It's you inevitably. You do in fact, there, there was actually... This was quite interesting. It was fascinating. A psychological study said that, you know, like, there was one particular time where the smart screens... Sorry, flat screens started coming up. Yeah. They said that that first flat screen, no matter what price it is, Let's just say it's a grand. Let's just say two grand, maybe it's 500 pounds. Whatever price it is, that's going to be the yardstick now. Yeah. That every other smart screen is going to be... It's, a, it's going to be measured by. And then it will drive down the price of all the others. No. Because the best one. Well, possibly. But what's going to happen is now, let's just say it's 500 pounds. And then you see another smart screen, flat screen, and it's 800. You're going to say that's expensive. Yeah. If it's three hundred pounds, you're gonna say that's cheap. If it's two thousand pounds, you're gonna say that's way too expensive because whether we like it or not, we do have a particular yardstick in our head. Yeah. It's like when the Western nations went to Native yeah, America yeah. and they saw the Native Indians yeah. and and they said that look, this is this is um, they they're so uncultured because they measured they measured culturedness through how a person would be dressed. So because they were naked, they I said... it was like technology as well, right? Because as well, like, yeah. Uh, yeah. They, they would have like gunpowder and guns, and there's nothing like you can do against someone who has a gun if you've just got like yeah. uh, spears or uh, bow and arrows or whatever they hunted with. Like, yeah. Uh, so uh, they, yeah, probably based it on technology and clothes and like... Uh, I, 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 they used, did they use horses or no? Or was they did, yeah. Okay, yeah. The Native Americans but was did, it yeah. brought in? Or like, or did the they horses in Native, um, in Native America, they did. They would use horses, spears, arrows. Yeah, yeah. They, were, they were pretty good with that sort of stuff. But I mean, in the 
the kind of certain tribe would be naked, they would be exposed at the top, and the yardstick that they would be measured by is this. So if you're coming back to the... So it's question, cultural relativism, as you're going to say. Yeah. yeah, and to be honest, like, I'm going to be honest, when I go to say... Well, I hope you're going to be honest, because whenever <laughs> somebody says to be honest, yeah. I'm like, well, I'm, I, I'm, I already assume you're being honest. But, like, <laughs> but sometimes, you know what it is? It's a disclaimer, because it's like four cameras there, and I'm going to give the example of Pakistan. Yeah. And the reason why I say that is because then a person puts their defences down if they're a viewer and they're going to be like, okay, he's just giving an example. Oh, or he's not trying to be malicious. Yeah. So, and you see from my example,